Jesus loved me, this I know. Amen. The Bible. The story of God's interaction with humankind. The story of our salvation. The, the guidebook for us. The, the Word of God. Now actually, if you look at the Bible, the Bible actually says the Word of God is Jesus. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and by him all things were made. John 1 says that the Word, but, but over the centuries we've, talk, we've started calling this the Word of God. Actually, it's the words about the Word. And I've been told all my life I need to apply the Bible to my life. I need to read it and take it seriously and apply it to my life. And I do. And I would encourage you to do the same because there is stuff here that you need to live. There's stuff here so that you know about God and what God thinks about you. For example, very first chapter, very first book, when God created the heaven, excuse me, when God created the heaven and the earth, when he created everything, when he created human beings, at the end of every single day of creation, God ended it the same way. He looked out and he said, that's good. That's, that's good. I, that's, that's, that's really good. And then when he made you and me, when he made humankind, when he made man and woman, and it says, male and female created he them, in his image created he them. When it got to, to man and woman, he said, that's the best I can do. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to rest. And he took a day off, the seventh day. And for that reason, the people of the Jews still to this day on sundown on Friday begin a Sabbath where they do no work. Oh, side note, I love taking people to Israel because on Friday evening in all hotels, there's the Sabbath elevator and there's the regular elevator. And I tell people, if you get on the Sabbath elevator, don't push any buttons because it won't matter. And I love to watch my people. They'd get on the Sabbath elevator and they'd stand there and go. And the wouldn't, door wouldn't close. That's because it's programmed to close, go up a floor, open, close, go up a floor. And it doesn't matter how many buttons you push because to the very conservative Jew, pushing a button is doing work on the Sabbath. So every hotel in Jerusalem, in Israel, has a Sabbath elevator. So that no matter, all you have to do is get in there and stand. And I would get in and watch people from my church get in. And I'd be standing there knowing I was in the Sabbath elevator. And Don would be going, something wrong with this elevator. No, it's working just fine. <laughs> You're on the Sabbath elevator, remember? The Bible. You're supposed to read it and apply it. At the early service, I said to the kids, you know, the Bible tells you that you're not supposed to eat hoopo. Have you ever eaten hoopo? I got tickled. I was saying, well, you know, the Bible very clearly says, you, it says in two places that you are not supposed to eat hoopo. And they said, I said, do you know what hoopo is? They said, no. And they said, what is hoopo? I said, I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> it's a bird. And then John found it, John found it on, uh, he Googled it. It looks, like a, it looks like a really punked out roadrunner. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> you know, you know, it looks like a, <laughs> you're not supposed to eat hoopo. Okay? So whenever you go to dinner today, if hoopo's on the menu, don't eat it. <laughs> now, of course, of course in, in the New Testament, Peter sees a vision, and there's all of these unclean animals in this sheet, this sheet that's, had, that's brought down from heaven. And he looks at it, and he hears a voice that says, rise and eat. And Peter says, no, 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 no. He says, I've never eaten unclean. And God says to Peter, don't call anything I've created unclean. So I guess in the New Testament faith, if you find hoopo and that's really what you want today, go ahead and have some. I don't know what it is, but the Bible, I'm supposed to read it, and I'm supposed to apply it, but I will have to tell you, 
and you probably surprise you, I've always been the inquisitive sort. I've always been the one that not only engaged the Bible with my faith and with my heart, but I engaged it with my mind. And I, and I, and I, was, I was that kid in Sunday school class that would say, you know, that doesn't make sense. I don't understand that. And I'm sure that my Sunday school teachers wanted to say, well, just believe it. It's, it's okay. It says it in the Bible. Believe it. But I would say, well, yeah, but, but, and I'd want to know more. Thankfully, as I grew up, I found out that John Wesley, John Wesley being who he was, being the, uh, an Anglican priest, and the Anglican church believed that to do theology, to do theological decisions, that you needed to look at scripture, reason, and tradition. And John Wesley added one thing. He added experience. He said that if we're going to make theological decisions, if we're going to impact the world, if we're going to live in the world, we need to first of all start with Scripture. And John Wesley said Scripture was primary. He called himself the man of one book. He called himself the man of one book, and that was the Bible. Now, he was the man of thousands of books. He was one of the most well-read people ever. I mean, he, he knew Greek, he knew Hebrew, he knew Latin. He read the classics. He made his lay preachers read the classics. That was in order to just be a lay preacher, not to be ordained, but to just to be a lay, lay preacher standing on the corner preaching the gospel. You had to read this list of books that was like this long. But John Wesley said, I am the man of one book. A friend of mine said that he was preaching once, and he said, uh, he said that, you know, the Bible, the Bible has, uh, has 66 books in it. And one fellow who was a physician in the church, he said, what? He said, it has 66 books. And he said, no, it doesn't. It's just one book. You know, like he was reading it like War and Peace from front cover to back cover. And, and, and my pastor friend said, no, actually, it's 66 books. It's different books that, that give us different things. For example, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament has, uh, has 39 books. In there is law. That's the first five books of the Bible. The law is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. If you're ever going to read the entire Bible, make sure you read the, in, the New Testament along with it at the same time. Because if you start in Genesis and you're reading it like you read War and Peace or like you read a novel, you're going to get into numbers and you're going to bog down. Because you're going to get to the passage where it says, don't eat buzzards. It does. And don't eat hoopo. And don't eat and don't eat and don't eat and don't eat this and don't eat that. And don't touch this and don't touch that. And if you touch this, you've got to be cleaned by doing that. And, and, and you'll get into the middle of Leviticus, and you'll go, oh, my goodness gracious. And you'll start skimming it. You know, <laughs> that's, just, that's just reality. Because those are old law. First five books is law. There's also history, chronicles, kings, the, the history of the, of the people of Israel, both the northern and the southern kingdom. And then there's the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the minor prophets, Micah, Malachi, or as a friend of mine got up one day to read the, God, the lesson from the Old Testament, and it was from Malachi, and it was one of the, the passages around Advent, and he got up and he was, he was very strong in his presence. He was a psychologist who loved to lead, and he got up and he said, the scripture lesson this day is from the prophet Malachi. <laughs> 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 And I kidded Jeff about the Italian prophet for the rest of the time <laughs> that, that I was in Beckley, you know. But there's the minor prophets, and then there's what they call the wisdom literature. That's Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon footnote. If you want to read an ancient wedding service, read Song of Solomon. That's what it is. Song of Solomon, it, it, and, and I always like to encourage couples to read it because it's full of compliments about your beauty. There's one that's my favorite. Not that one, Janet, it's the other one. There's one that's my favorite. The, the, it says, You are beautiful, my love. Your hair is like a flock of goats moving down the face of Gilead. Your neck is like the Tower of David, Whereupon hang a thousand bucklers of warriors. 
That's a compliment. <laughs> read, read Song of Solomon. It's this, it's this ancient celebration of human love and human sexuality and, and sensuality and all that kind of stuff. It's an, amazing, it's an amazing book that people won't read because they don't know what it is. It's, it's an ancient celebration of marriage. In the New Testament, the New Testament has 27 books. We have four Gospels. We have the Acts of the Apostles, which is a kind of a history. We have the Epistles. And these literally are letters. These are, this is the Apostle Paul sitting down and saying, To the saints at Rome, grace and peace in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he says, I've heard, and in Romans he says, I've heard so many good things about what's going on in, in, in Rome and how you're being faithful to Jesus Christ. And, and there's this long, flowery, hello, salutation. Scholars say that Galatians is the angry letter because when he writes Galatians, he says, to the saints in Galatia, what in the world are you doing? That's roughly translated because they're following some, by, uh, some teaching that he didn't teach them. And he's wanting, to, he's wanting to say, hey, pay attention, folks. You're getting all goofed up here without needing it. He starts right in and he's, they call it the angry letter. It's a letter written to the church. Paul didn't think he was writing scripture. He was writing advice letters. And then when the people sat down after Paul and they looked at those, they said, you know what? There's eternal stuff in here. Faith, hope, and love, these three abide, but the greatest of these is love. There's eternal stuff in here. And they began to read it to each other. And they began to see it as holy writ, as, as where God had communicated to the church. And then there's a thing called the apocalypse. Now, you don't see it that way because it doesn't say the apocalypse of John when you read it. It says the revelation of John. The book of Revelations. The book that everybody knows what's in it but nobody reads. I'm going to do a series on the book of Revelation this coming summer. And, and look at it for, for what it is as an apocalypse, as a part of a particular kind of literature so that, that you can help under, so we can help understand actually what, what it is. Old Testament and New Testament. Now, our brothers and sisters who are in the, the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox community, they recognize uh, some extra books. They call it the, the Apocrypha. As Protestants, we say that, we, yes, there are good religious writings, but we don't consider them to be Scripture. But our brothers and sisters in the Episcopal and Roman Catholic and Orthodox communities do, and that's all right. If you ever see, I have a Bible upstairs that has the Apocrypha in it. There's good stuff in there. Now, where did it come from? It came from all kinds of sources. It came from all kinds of people, and it was brought together. Brought together by, by first, the Jewish faith, this is the neat thing about that passage that you read, Jim. I know you're back there. Uh, you, you, you disappeared. Um, that passage that says that Scripture is, is for reproof and training in righteousness and so on and so on and so on, when that was written, that was referring to the Old Testament. There was no New Testament when Paul wrote that. It was referring to, referring to the Old Testament, that everything that you need to know about coming to faith in Jesus Christ is there, is in the Scripture. Now, what's happened is across the years as we've lived into it, we say the same thing now about the New Testament, that it is what we need for, for direction and guidance and for, um, and for training in righteousness. Well, how do we do it then? How are we supposed to read it? How, is it, how do you and I do it when there are times that we say, I just don't understand this. I don't get it. I would encourage you to read it the best you can and ask a well, question about it. What did it mean then? What does it mean now? And what does it mean to me? Now, let me be absolutely open with you and say there's going to be some stuff that you're going to read that won't make any sense. Or it won't make sense for us today, for, modern, for the modern world. For example, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, when you've come up to a city and you're at war with them, give them an opportunity to surrender. And if they don't, kill them all. 
and keep the women and children as the booty for winning the war. It says that. There is no way. There, I, I cannot do what, the, what, what a woman did at Salem United Methodist Church when Chuck Eccles was teaching. He said, uh, he said now in, in such and such a book, and, and the woman said, that's not in my Bible, preacher. And he said, well, yes, it is. It's in such and such a, a, a passage. And she said, no, that's not in my Bible. And he said, well, let me see your Bible. And he picked up her Bible and looked at it and turned to where it was supposed to be. And anything that she didn't like in the Bible, she'd torn out. <laughs> so it was not in her Bible. <laughs> it's kind of like, don't do that. If you're having trouble, if you're, tr- if you're having to wrestle, wrestle with it. Adam Hamilton, in his book uh, entitled Making Sense of the Bible, teaches that, that he believes there's three types of material in the Scripture. One is material that was cultural and was God's will for the time. Two is stuff that was cultural and that we just have to admit we can't imagine was even God's will, that it was more the, the things that were happening and people were writing about. For example, kill everybody. That they called it, the, 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 I, I can't imagine that God would ever be pleased that God's people killed everyone that they were fighting with. And then the third bucket, he says, is that which is eternal. That's good. That which is eternal and means the same thing today as it did 2,000, 4,000 years ago when it was written. And a part of what we have to do is, is to find out which, oh, for example, it does say in the Bible that women are to have long hair. Any of you get your hair cut? You wretched sinners. <laughs> in the book of 1 Corinthians, it says long hair is a woman's glory. It does say that. And in the teaching of the Apostle Paul is you're not supposed to cut your hair. And it says, men, you're not to have long hair. Well, it looks like most of you are doing all right with that. So <laughs> I would argue with my mom about that when the Beatles came out. Remember the Beatles? They had such long hair. <laughs> now they call it a bob. Uh, you know, and my, my, my mom would say, you're not supposed to have long hair. I said, Mom, Jesus had long hair. You don't know that. Yeah, you're right, I don't. Wasn't there. But all the pictures have him with long hair. <laughs> As I studied scripture, I come to find out that in Corinth, in the city of Corinth, it was a seaport, the women who had the very, very short hair worked in the local temple of Diana, which was a a fertility cult. They were the temple prostitutes. Paul was saying to the women in the Corinthian Christian church, Don't cut your hair in such a way that people get confused as to who you are. Now that's a principle that you can apply. Don't do things in this culture that will make people wonder, is that person really a, a person of Christ or is that somebody else? That's a principle you can apply. But long hair, short hair, it's hair, folks. I assure you, I had much longer hair when I was 20 years old. I had long curly hair when I was 20 years old. I look at those pictures and go, <laughs> you know, I, I, that's what I was. I guess I may have grown it out just to say to mom, see mom, long hair, still a preacher. <laughs> you know, you know. How do you read, you got to take, you got to take the scripture seriously and apply it as best you can. Learn from it as best you can. And when stuff doesn't make sense, be honest enough to say, that doesn't make sense. And then study. Talk to your friends. Talk to me. Talk to Janet. Talk to folks that you respect so that they can help you explore. Because that's the other thing that Wesley taught. Wesley taught that you had to use your mind. He said that we use reason. We think stuff through. How do I apply that? How do I use my mind? What is my mind telling me about this situation? What is, how, when I reflect upon it, what is God telling me as I use my mind? Then he also says experience. Remember I told you that I grew up believing that everybody who drank or smoked were wretched sinners? That's what I, to this day, I don't smoke. 
because I was told as a child, Christians don't smoke and Christians don't drink. I remember one of my, I didn't have many girlfriends, I really didn't, um, but one of my girlfriends wanted me to, to uh, share a bottle of Boone's Farm wine with her. As God is my witness. No, I'm sorry, I don't drink. I'm a Christian. She broke up with me about three weeks later. <laughs> you know, you know. And that was because someone told me. My experience was... Now, I didn't know anything different. I was a child. I was a teenager. But my experience and my tradition said, you don't do this. Okay, that's good. I have yet... To, I've never smoked. And I will tell you, it's not because my family didn't. It's because somebody in Sunday school told me Christians don't smoke. Now, you know what? I ran into people as I grew up that drank, and they were good Christians. That smoked, and they were good Christians. And you know what? I had to engage my mind. I had to start reasoning it. I had to think about experience about the people that I've experienced for whom a glass of wine was nothing more important or less important than a glass of Dr. Pepper. So my reason, my experience had to fall in place. And then Wesley said, if you're going to use the, the, not only Scripture, you start with Scripture, but then you go to experience and then reason, you finish with tradition. That tradition is what has been the tradition of the church. Let's use communion. Communion. Tradition, I've told you this before, if John Wesley showed up for church today, he would tell me that something had gone wrong with the wine. It's gone flat. Because John Wesley was an Anglican and they used wine. Early in the 1900s, the Methodist church, along with a couple of other Protestant churches, said that our witness for those people who have alcohol problems is that we will no longer use alcohol as a part of the communion ritual. We will use grape juice. So my tradition all my life has been grape juice. You can imagine what happened when I went to an Episcopal service at West Virginia Wesleyan College. It was 7 a.m. I was going to be holy and righteous, and I got up, and I went to Doc, Reverend Grady Barber was having the service there in Wesley Chapel's Meditation Chapel, and I came forward for communion, and I received the bread, and I took the bread, and he gave me the common cup. We'd never done a common cup, and everybody was drinking out of that cup, and it was kind of like, <laughs> but I was in line. So, so he gave it to me. I took a sip, and I went, ooh, that's not grape juice. And I hadn't had breakfast yet. My stomach was upset for like three hours because I, I <laughs> you know, ooh, that's pretty nasty stuff. <laughs> you know? He broke outside my tradition. Now, once again, I grew up and I realized that the vast majority of the Christian world takes communion every Sunday and they use real wine. I know that. But my tradition says... It's still grape juice, and that's what we use. And my tradition says it's at once a month, on the first Sunday of the month, except where Janet and I grew up, it was four times a year. If you're trying to live the most faithful discipleship you can do, John Wesley teaches us to use scripture, experience, reason, and tradition. And those four things make the table upon which we set our theological understanding, taking it seriously and trying to live for Christ in the midst of all of it. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.